if I told you that the world as we know it is no more, and that there's one word that would secure a better future for all of us. But before I get into that, let me tell you a few stories. I'm gonna tell you three stories, in fact. I'm gonna tell you a personal story, a corporate story, and a global story. Let's start with the personal story. So over 15 years ago, I was recruited from Canada to Silicon Valley by a high-tech multinational. And one thing that struck me when I met Americans for the first time was the uh, sympathetic tone that they would give me and, and the look, and they would kind of tilt their head to the side and they'd say, oh, you're Canadian. Canadians are so nice. And I leave the conversation a bit perplexed. I'm like, what do they mean by that? Was I not a worthy contender? Was I so exceptionally unthreatening by being a Canadian? And so I gave this more thought and I realized for me to be successful in the US, I had to change. And so I became a hybrid of practices. I learned from the Americans and I uh, adapted to and adopted some of their more assertive American ways along with being the Canadian who I was in order for me to continue on and to be somewhat successful there. Now, let me shift gears and get into the second story. I'm gonna tell you about that terrific high-tech multinational that I went to Silicon Valley to work for. Now, they were a world-class company and I was so proud to work for them. In fact, they were a uh, leader in the industry, they were innovators, they had market share dominance, uh, they had major brand equity because of their product superiority. So essentially, they were the best. And then things started to change a little bit and we were be, uh, being challenged by emerging competitors and we weren't winning business in certain markets as easily as we were used to. So what had changed? What happened? As it turns out, we did such a good job at being the best that foreign companies were emulating our business strategy from product development right down to marketing approaches. And I know this uh, firsthand because I was tasked with monitoring and uh, addressing some of these uh, new sales dynamics. And so they say that imitation is the finest form of flattery, but it doesn't protect revenues and market share. And so we quickly learned that we needed to adjust. We needed to adjust our business strategy in certain markets in order to stay ahead and to secure or hold our, our position of strength. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, great, great stories, but what does that have to do with me? Let me get into the global story and let's take a look at how it was, how it's been and how it has become. So the West, which includes Canada, the US, Western European countries, etc., have had pretty good economies in the last few decades, don't you think? Right? The prosperity has allowed us to have very strong buying power uh, and a great standard of living. In fact, shopping has become a favorite pastime for many of us. Right? And the uh, additional uh, spending power has allowed us to upgrade our homes, etc. Life has been pretty good. Then, um, in 1976, with the joining of Canada to the G7, the International Monetary Fund said that these countries were the most advanced economies in the world, and they represented more than 50% of the net global wealth. And they would get together occasionally and uh, talk about macroeconomics and uh, international uh, trade and relations with developing countries. Now, because of this concentration of power, in uh, a few, uh, in the hands of a few countries that shared sem similar views and values, they were able to uh, direct the global economy and they were able to decide to be nice. They decided that they were gonna help the emerging countries grow, right, by being cooperative, by establishing partners, partnerships, by, um, you know, contributing funds and knowledge transfer and mar you know, special allowances and market access, et cetera. And then they did such a good job at uh, being nice, at being giving and cooperative, that it fueled the growth of the emerging countries. 
And so this power gap is closing, right? To the point where these emerging countries' wealth became so strong, they got a voice at the table. And so the G20 was formed with developed countries and developing countries coming together um, and giving everybody more power in determining how the global economy was going to be run, right? So as you see here, uh, countries like China, like India, like Brazil, came into the mix. And so now there's a power shift, and the West has to adjust to this power shift. And the thing is, these new players don't necessarily play by the same rules. Right? So we hear a lot of complaints about unfair trade practices or infringement of intellectual property laws, et cetera. So again, the influence and the power of the West has been marginalized, and we need to shift and adjust to accept this power shift. All right, so again, so why do you care? She's talking economics. This is way beyond me. Let's bring it down to your concerns. Uh, the Western economies are suffering. We are not growing like we used to grow. Take a look at this chart and look at Canada's GDP decline over the last five years. Pretty aggressive, isn't it? Right? And if you even compare uh, Canada and, and the US, the US's growth at under 2% compared to China at 6.5 to 7%, of course, that's always debatable, but it's still larger. And then unemployment rates are exceptionally high. 7% in Canada, we see in, in the US, they're clamoring for their jobs, their manufacturing jobs to come back home. They've lost too many jobs overseas. What are you gonna do about it, politicians? And of course, the cost of living has, has gone up significantly. Real estate costs, so because these emerging countries are wealthier, they're coming over and they're buying your real estate and a top dollar to the point where your local economies are, are placing 15% taxes on foreign purchasers just to try to contain the high skyrocketing real estate prices. And then we're gonna get into this a little more later, but our competitive advantage is also threatened. So why should you care? Your standard of living, your quality of life is at stake. All right, so more than ever, right? The West needs to shift gears and wake up. We really need to just wake up and do things differently. We no longer can afford to be nice, or at least not in the same way that we have been. We need to look within and change. Easy enough to say. So what do, this, do all of these economic downturns and threats provoke? They provoke a reaction of let's protect. Let's protect and grow just on the inside, right? Within our own borders. And just like in the airline industry when they say, Make sure you put your oxygen mask on first before you help others. That's the same reaction that politicians are having. We, and we've seen this, right? Insulate, protect the home front. Let's get competitive. If we don't take care of number one, who's going to take care of number one? By the way, there is only one number one. It's going to be us, right? And then we get into the import um, taxes and tariffs, and we get into manufacturing and bring it home, et cetera. And so, in other words, the, the whole idea, the concept is, let's play hardball and let's be less nice. And this isn't just rhetoric, right? We've seen this with Brexit, and we've seen it with the recent USA protectionist movement. Now, I do believe that we, we do need to take better care of the home front. Times uh, have changed, and we can no longer operate under the same rules and, and procedures that we have in the past. But the question is, so what do we do? So what I had just described is, uh, you know, with the whole protectionist movement, is l running uh, sprints when the race really is a marathon. It's not sustainable, right? So if we do take the protectionist approach, and bring jobs home, it really only has a short run reaction, right, or, or reward, but it really is only damaging to our economy in the long run. So let's take a specific example. If, say, we did uh, apply import tariffs and taxes to foreign goods coming into our country, while it would create more jobs, that actually ca causes us to have more costs, 
Higher costs equals inflation. Inflation causes in higher interest rates. Higher interest rates means reduced investment, right? And less spending, thus further stagnation of our economy. And let's, let's also not forget, this is gonna cause retaliation by other countries on our goods. They're not gonna let us in either. And we need global trade for us to grow. And based on the charts that I showed you before, we really need to grow. So now what? So clearly, uh, either extreme is, is not a viable option. We can't be super cooperative and extremely nice and giving and partner and have the giving to be one way, nor can we be hyper competitive or super protectionist because at the end of the day, they both have uh, not very strong outcomes in the long run. So the new way, what we need to do is change and adapt. The West needs to shift gears by accepting this new world order. We need to accept that there's a power shift and that there's new players in the mix and that they play by different rules and that we maybe need to learn from them and adopt some of their practices in order for us to become more successful going forward. We need to shift from this comfort zone of being the best. It's been, it's been a great ride. Right? The last few decades, we've set the global standard. Everyone looked to us. Being the best is a pretty comfortable place at, at a certain point. But being the best is a little bit on the static side. We need to shift to a philosophy of becoming better. And by better, we need to learn. We need to evolve. We need to shift the way we do business in order to stay ahead. So like the two stories that I mentioned at the beginning, Right? When I had to shift gears and become a little bit more American to succeed in a new culture. And just like the American multinational that had to change its business approach in order to be um, a little bit more successful within new market dynamics, so too do we all have to change in certain ways. And let's talk a little bit about innovation now. And what I call the innovation advantage, which has been our competitive differentiator on the international scene. The West, especially Canada and the US, has been known to be innovators. And emerging countries have looked to us for, for um, innovation. And by looking towards us, they have grown and they've learned and they've taken on their own innovation models. China, for example, is, is a great example. They're becoming innovative on their own. But they've done that by sending droves of delegations over here into Silicon Valley to learn how to become innovative. When's the last time we sent delegations to China to learn about maybe supply chain efficiencies or new business models? And by the way, we really need to get smarter about commercializing or monetizing our innovations. We're very proud of being clever and innovative and smart, but are we really making that much money from them? Couldn't we make a little bit more? But that's another topic for another day. Now, the real kicker for me was when I discovered that China thinks that they're more innovative than Canada. In their uh, National Innovation Index report, they actually ranked Canada at number 20 and ranked themselves at number 18. So even the perception of Canada as an innovator is weakening with emerging markets. A little bit alarming. So at the end of the day, what I'm suggesting is that we need to be more innovative at innovation. We need to recreate our, our competitive advantage. All right, so I'm not suggesting at the end of the day that you give up on being nice. I'm simply suggesting that you take on a new flavor of nice. So instead of good old vanilla nice, Maybe it's a tutti fruity kind of nice, right? A mix of different practices. We need to take care of our own interests while we are cooperating and collaborating with other nations, right? Mutual interests are important, but that's the key is two-way exchange, making sure that those exchanges are uh, mutual. And taking on a philosophy of being better and adapting and learning. This win-win attitude also has to be two ways. Fair trade is key. And reciprocity from all parties involved is really important for this to work. 
And it's not just one nation or two nations, it's all nations. So the one word uh, that I promised you at the beginning of our talk is really not either one of these practices. Look, our, the world has become bigger and smaller at the same time. Our economies are too intertwined and too inter interdependent, and gone are the days of global dominance by one player or even a few players. We need each other's uh, differentiated benefits in our economies to grow. We can no longer just grow um, within our own nations. And so we need to foster this collaborative attitude. And so we can't just be cooperative, and nor can we be purely competitive. That one word that will secure our future success is the combination of the two. That one word is co-opetition. Thank you.